Welcome to lecture 13 of our series on prosody. Here we look at many different ways to visualize and represent prosody. Humans need visuals. As we said earlier, sound is fleeting. Consider the following. Talking about learning styles is not going to help. Okay, nice little utterance. What can you say about the prosody? Probably not much as the sound rapidly fades from your auditory buffer. If we can create a visualization, it's static and we can examine it at leisure. So let's talk about some visualization options. We've already seen pitch and energy plots with the blue dots for pitch and the green line for intensity. It's not that pitch and loudness are uniquely important, but the other prosodic properties, squeaky voice, lengthening, reduction, and so on, are even harder to compute reliably. And so they're rarely visualized. There's a huge unmet need here. Anyway, looking just at the pitch dots, we have a very honest representation of pitch across time. Each dot represents one computed pitch point. But perceptually, we hear a smooth pitch, pitch contour, so let's connect the dots. You know, Pratt is making all of this very easy for us. Props to the inventors of Pratt. Okay, we've lost a little bit of information here, but the result is much prettier and maybe more informative. We can go a step further and apply some smoothing. So here comes the slow fade. There it is, okay. I did this in PowerPoint, but there are packages that can automatically smooth, either by local smoothing or by fitting lines or curves to the F0 track. Is it okay then to forget the original F0 information? Well, maybe. For some purposes, this is prettier, maybe more interpretable. Uh, we can go a step further and interpolate. While those pitch gaps are real, they are perhaps not perceptually significant. So it's sometimes okay to patch them up, maybe even just linearly, but that can also be confusing at times. Or we can reject interpolation and not only leave the gaps, but also show places where the percept is weaker. We've seen these rib ribbon diagrams before. They encode not only the pitch, but also an intensity correlate, periodicity. They're also aesthetically pleasing, and shouldn't we strive to have more beauty in our lives? Well, be that as it may, these are sort of things we can do to enhance, fix up the visualization. They're pretty conservative we can try to go a little further and represent only what matters and just throw away the rest. So here's that same pitch track stretched out so I can add the words now. Now maybe your theory says that only the average pitch on each word matters. If so, that's easy to represent. Assume you've transcribed your data. And depending on your theory, that may be enough by itself to represent the pitch. How's this? So we've lost the initial F0 contour, but there's a lot of information there. Maybe it's enough, depending upon your pur purposes. Or maybe there's a different theory of what matters. Maybe not the average height per word, but the pitch turning points. So from our original F0 contour, we could pick them out like this. Again, I did this by hand, but there are tools for this. And also tools with the ability to draw lines between these points as a way to obtain a stylized contour. All right. So in summary, we've seen two strategies for abstraction, two ways to deal with the overwhelming complexity of, of pitch tracks. First, we can tidy things up. Ideally, our tools would detect microprosodic effects and correct for them. Um, in practice, they mostly just smooth and interpolate. It's not risk-free, but still on the conservative si side. And it doesn't really make any assumptions about what language you're dealing with. The other strategy is more radical. So the idea is to extract what matters either in being perceptually salient or important in some other way. Do we really know what matters? Well, sometimes we do, a little bit, at least for English. For English, we know pitch height is important and that pitch on stressed syllables is more salient. So we can use a traditional British notation, sometimes called tadpole notation, where we mark pitch height with height on the page, syllable by syllable, and mark loudness by circle size. Further, if there are significant pitch excursions within a syllable, we indicate that too. Some of these look like tadpoles, hence the name. So these are good for teaching. Show a figure like this, someone could really see how it was said and then replicate it pretty well. If you'd like to try, hit pause. All right, did you try? Talking about learning styles is not going to help. Okay, that's the way I originally said it. Uh, maybe your recreation matched that pretty well. You know, these diagrams can really be pretty informative. Perhaps you can see an overall presence of a contradiction contour shape here. 
the fact that these diagrams show the relation between pitch and intensity is also a big plus. So on the word learning, you see a late pitch rise. Um, normally the pitch peak occurs right in the center of the energy peak, right in the center of the syllable. But if I'm talking about learning styles, it comes later. If you were writing this down, that might be a, a cue, a clue that you would want to put quotes around learning styles here. Our final example is Toby for tones and break indices. In the name, tone is rather metaphorical. In any case, Toby builds on the old tradition of marking H's and L's, and it makes two strong assumptions. First, it assumes that pitch height is categorical, that the exact values do not matter, just whether it's H or L. Of course, in reality, some H's will be higher than others, but this can often be inferred. For example, we know that English sentences have declination, so the H at the start will have to be higher than the H at the end. And since this is always true, there's no need to clutter up the representation with such details, usually. Uh, second, Toby assumes that only the targets matter. In English, the unstressed syllables, those mostly come along for the ride. They don't really have an independent pitch, so there's no need to explicitly represent anything about them. Now, the visualizations we saw before were mostly intended for describing individual sentences and mostly as visualizations to, to show things, to help human eyes see what's going on. Toby, in contrast, approaches a representation. In general, representations can be used for encoding general rules about the language you're describing. Ideally, we could use them to represent prosody symbolically and far more concisely and forget entirely about the messiness we see in any real specific sentence. But effective representations are, at best, incredibly difficult to design. All right. so. Lots of methods are available for visualizing and representing prosody. Uh, a few cautions. Auditory and visual perception may differ. Just because something doesn't stand out when you plot it doesn't mean it doesn't stand out to the ear. Intonation alone, just that F0 contour, that may be misleading. And some of the assumptions in some of these models may be appropriate for some languages but not others. You know, it, it's up to you. So if you're interested in language teaching or linguistic theory or aids to empirical discovery, you, you can have lots of choices. You can figure out which one's going to work best for your purpose. All right, that wraps it up for the first half of discussion of linguistic prosody. We'll have three more lectures on that later. But before we go there, in the next lecture, we'll revisit questions of abstraction and representation, starting with the nuts and bolts question of how to compute prosodic features robustly.